Um, as Paul's already mentioned, I'm a PhD student at the University of Leeds studying the ethics of social robotics. And I'm really interested in whether humans can be friends, not just with fellow humans or other sentient creatures, but with robots and machines. And as robots increasingly enter intimate human life, this has gone from being in the realm of science fiction to something that I'm actually quite concerned about. Um, so the kind of robots that I'm going to be talking about today are predominantly social robots. And these are autonomous or semi-autonomous machines with artificial intelligence that are designed to interact with humans in an interpersonal manner often exhibiting lifelike uh, characteristics, um, such as human characteristics or animal characteristics. So the kind of robots I'm interested in are the one that you can see on the screen here. This is Amica. Um, many people seem to think that Amica is the most advanced humanoid robot on the planet that exists today. As Paul just mentioned, there's also Ada, who was the first humanoid robot to give evidence at the House of Lords just a few weeks ago. There's also kind of sex robot technology, which I'm sure some of you might have a few questions about, and I'll, I'll welcome those questions. Um, this robot that you can see here is called Harmony. Um, it's a, got a silicone body with an artificial head attached to it. And you can buy one of these on the market right now for about $6,000. Um, the prices increase of these robots if you want to customize features. For example, you can change the shape of its breasts, its waist size, uh, the shape of its vagina, or you can even um, manipulate its personality. For example, you can choose to have a personality that is young, uh, mature, or even frigid. Um, there's also robots that are, uh, are modelled on animal robots. So this one here is designed by Sony. It's modelled on a dog. And Sony claims that not only can humans develop strong relationships with this robot dog, but also the dog can develop a relationship with the human owner. And finally, here's just a picture of me, which I included, I don't know why, just for, for sheer vanity. Um, but yeah, I met this little dinosaur robot at a conference I was at recently. And to be honest, I was always very skeptical about whether I'd like robots. You know, I don't have a smartphone. Technology is not really something that I invest in normally. Um, but this little robot walked up to me and I picked it up and I held it against my chest like this and it fell asleep. And all of a sudden I was like, oh, hang on a minute. I kind of get it now. These are, <laughs> this is cool. Um, so when we're talking about whether humans and robots can be friends with each other, one thing that's really important to know is that friendship necessarily involves mutual love. So if I'm going to claim that I'm in a relationship of friendship with a robot, it's not only the case that I, I am friends with the robot, I have love for this robot, but this robot's got to love me back. And talking about love is something that's very abstract and difficult to get our head around. So what I do in my research is I appeal to a very famous philosopher, I'm sure some of you have heard of Aristotle here in the room tonight. Um, and he argues that friendship involves two, uh, sorry, love in a, friend, in a context of friendship involves two um, characteristics. The first is that if I love my friend, it's the case that I desire them. Um, for example, I might desire their great sense of humor, uh, the fact that they're absolutely minted, um, or the fact that they're just fun to be around. And the second thing is that we, want good will, we have goodwill for our friends, so we want what's best for them. Okay, so to make this a little bit less abstract, uh, consider the following examples. So imagine there is a guy called I don't know, Paul, we'll call him Paul for tonight's sake. And um, Paul gets driven to work every day by a butler. And Paul desires this butler because she's very good at weaving in and out of traffic um, and very good at following maps, making sure he gets to work on time. And he also has goodwill for the driver, let's call her Sarah, for example. Uh, and that's because, you know, um, he wants what's best for her, he's got to know her over time, he's invested in his family. And likewise, the driver seems to have a relationship with Paul. You know, she desires him because he always uses contactless function, for example, instead of using cash. And the driver also seems to have goodwill for Paul. When he gets in the car, straight away she's like, get your seatbelt on. Um, and when he arrives at work, she always says, have a really good day. So it seems here, like, you know, pretty plausible that Sarah and Paul here 
are in a relationship of friendship, albeit in a kind of weak sense of friendship. But I'm wondering whether that would still be the case if Paul is a human, but Sarah is an AI system <clears throat> encased in the form of a driverless car. So, <clears throat> excuse me, to answer these <clears throat> kinds of questions, um, what I'm going to do first is consider whether humans can love robots. And then I'm going to go back and I'm going to consider, can robots love humans? So let's consider the former. Now, I'm hoping most of you in the room tonight will share my intuition that humans can love robots. After all, we have friendly feelings towards teddy bears, dolls, um, and even fictional characters in our books. So why on earth can't we love robots in a very similar way? And there's just a couple of things I'd like to note about this kind of relationship. Firstly, when people form relationships with lifeless objects, such as dolls or robots, we're often quick to judge, and we think, mm, maybe they're a bit pathetic, maybe they're childish, maybe they're a bit, just a bit of a weirdo in general, to be honest. Um, <laughs> and I'd like to say, actually, I think that's wrong. Firstly, um, the kinds, we can't stereotype the kinds of people involved in these relationships. Um, that's because not only are people who might be ostracized from society or incels and be invested in these robots, but also so too are roboticists. This here is a picture of Cynthia Brazil. Um, she is a very, very famous social roboticist and she actually designed this robot here, Kismet, as part of her PhD uh, project. And it's very well known that throughout the process of designing this robot, Cynthia developed strong, loving feelings towards the robot and started to grieve significantly when uh, it came to the end of her PhD project and she was no longer able to take this robot home with her. So that kind of covers maybe, um, hu it seemed quite obvious that humans can love robots. Let's consider the other question now. Can robots love humans? Well, this is really kind of philosophically tricky to answer. Um, lots of philosophers aren't even sure how we can come to know that other humans love us. But what I do in my research is I say, well, if love involves desiring us and having these kind of mental attitudes, maybe what we can do here to try and start theorizing about this stuff is saying, okay, we can generalize and we can say, if it's the case that a robot's going to love us, it has to have certain mental attitudes. Now that sounds quite bonkers, but there are a lot of people that will back this suggestion that robots actually do have mental attitudes. And a couple, I've not got time um, at this initial introduction, but there are um, a few methods that we can take to try and figure out whether robots do actually have mental states like humans and therefore whether robots can love humans. The first one involves uh, conducting kinds of empirical tests. Some of you in the room might be familiar with Alex Turing's um, The Turing Test. The second kind of experiment we might do is think about, hmm, well, just as we're justified in looking at other human beings and thinking that they have desires and goodwill towards us and these kind of mental states as a result of their behavior, maybe if these machines have the same behaviors, if they're exhibiting the same kind of responses that humans do, then maybe we're able to say that they're just analogous to humans and therefore they have mental states. And the final um, methodology we might appeal to is called the inference to best explanation. And this basically just says, let's list all of the possible hypotheses, okay? And let's think about which one best explains what's going on here when we're thinking that robots are loving us. One of them, for example, might be that God is controlling the robot like a puppet. Another one might be that robots do have minds and mental states and they are really loving us. And another one might just be that robots do not have minds. Rather, we, they are best ex their behaviors are best explained by other processes, such as deep learning or machine learning. Now, my, in my conclusion, what, what do I get having followed these methodologies? I think that humans can definitely love robots. And I think that robots can really <coughs> appear to love uh, humans back. But I don't think that robots really do love humans back. And therefore, they're not engaged in a mutual relationship. There's no reciprocity here. What's going on is these, these two entities, one human, one robot, they're not friends with each other. And something that kind of supports this conclusion is if we look at other smart technologies, 
many of us wouldn't look at a strawberry picking robot on the street and come to the conclusion that it's controlled by having certain mental states such as desire and goodwill. Thank you. Okay. okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm now wishing, I haven't got any slides. Uh, I'm, I'm slightly wishing that I dug out a video because I remembered as you were speaking that I, I have the, the mental rule, never work with children, animals or robots. Ever since doing a, a comedy show on the Edinburgh Fringe with someone called Matt Parker, which was about engineering. And part of the, uh, part of the show was that he was trying to outsource all his bits of the show to robots. And he said, it's brilliant. We're going to get this little programmable robot and I can program it and it can be in the show and it can play a part. So he got this robot, he bought it second hand, possibly a mistake, got it out of the box and turned it on and it literally, it, it kind of, it stretches when it wakes up. It stretches and it literally stretched and looked at us and turned around and walked off stage into the wings. <laughs> and this was the beginning of it being completely intractable for the whole time. Uh, so somewhere there's a video online of it, of us trying to get it to hand out leaflets because it was the Edinburgh Fringe and it just like naughty toddler from beginning to end. So I had no love for that robot. But having said that, I was also remembering that the little robot dogs you showed they have funeral services for them in Japan because they've stopped uh, servicing them. They've stopped making the spare parts for them. And people are still really, really attached to them. And so what they're having to do is when they stop working, uh, if, they're, if people are prepared to give them up, they basically dismantle them for parts and use them to repair the other ones. But the people are so upset that they have to have a funeral service. Sorry, I'm... I'm just touching the microphone. The people are so upset they have to have a funeral service for the dog so that they can say goodbye to it. But also in Japan, they also have funeral services for dolls when children grow up and it's like, well, okay, I'm, I'm a grown up now. I'm not going to play with dolls anymore. But this doll, by virtue of my loving it, it has acquired some elements of humanity. And this is quite a core Japanese belief that Physical objects, man-made objects, if we relate to them for long enough, so the typical length of time is 100 years, then they acquire a soul, basically. So it's, it's quite an animistic way of looking at things and people. So, so I think, you know, it is very plausible that certainly that we have these attitudes to, uh, to the robots. So I was thinking about this question and I realized that I was kind of trying to ask myself two slightly separate questions. So one of them is the question is a robot a person and the other question is can only persons be our friends? Do you have to be a person to be, to be a friend or can you be an object? And so I'm going to try and address the question of whether a robot is a person by looking at the other question about whether a friend needs to be a person. And I also realised that I've been looking a little bit at Montaigne, the, um, the, the Enlightenment essayist, or maybe just pre-Enlightenment, and, uh, and that he had a, a quote about his friend, uh, whose name I've forgotten and can't pronounce, who he was very, very close to, and, and it seems that when this friend died quite young from an illness, Montaigne was so upset that this actually precipitated a whole change in his life, and he went off and, and began a life of extreme introspection <coughs> and philosophizing because he'd lost this friend. And, and the, the quotes, the actually two run together, that, uh, that I'd pulled out about this. So he's talking about his friend. He says, our souls had drawn so unanimously together, they had considered each other with so ardent an affection and with a like affection laid open the very bottom of our hearts to one another's view, that I not only knew his as well as my own, but should certainly in any concern of mine have trusted my interest much more willingly with him than with myself. He alone partook of my true image and carried it off with him. And that is why I so curiously decipher myself. And it seemed that this, this kind of pulls out three things that I, I certainly feel are core to, to friendship. Um, one of them is that a friend should know me. 
really well and in a way, in the same way that I know them. So it's a reciprocal uh, relationship of knowing. And in, in the course of looking at data, and you know, the, there was a saying a few years back, which I shamelessly used to sell the previous book, which was, uh, big data knows you better than you know yourself. Uh, but of course, it's not true, because it, it, big data knows a lot of things about you. Or when, you know, when data is collected on you, people, people make a profile of you. They know lots of things about you, lots of external facts, and they can infer things about you, but they don't actually know you the way another human knows you because a machine can't imagine what it's like to be you, doesn't know you from the inside. So uh, the analogy I always use is that when, when they dig up old skeletons and they say, oh, you know, with science, they can know all sorts of things like what illnesses this person had and the fact that this person lost their nose probably to syphilis and this person was attacked with a sword and defended themselves and it, they lived but they would have been scarred to the hand and the face forever and this person had chronic toothache for 50 years and would have been in pain the whole time. And it's like, yeah, fine, well, that's really amazing that you can learn this, but it doesn't tell you the important stuff like this person was the astronomer Tycho Brahe and this was American President Andrew Jackson and this was Queen Elizabeth I of England. You know, it's like the most important things about these people are the things that they were thinking and doing and feeling, the, the things that were important to them. And I think that's the, so a machine can know lots of things about me. It can study my behavior and find patterns and compare me to lots of other people and predict things probabilistically about me. But it doesn't know me the way another human can know me because when we know each other, yes, okay, we're inferring things about mental states, but we're inferring it on the basis of, well, if this was me in your situation, what would I be thinking and feeling and doing? So it's a, it's a different kind of knowledge. So I'm not convinced machines can do that. Another thing which I think Montaigne is hinting at, but I think is really important, that a friend can challenge me and not just agree with everything I do and not just be nice to me. And you know, this, the, the, you, you know your, is it your, your, your bad friends are just are nice to you the whole time and agree with you, but your good friends are the ones that go, why, why are you acting like such an asshole? Or, I, you know, I really think you could do better than that. And, you know, you're, you're kind of cruising a bit. Don't you think you should try a bit harder than that? And, you know, it can be, can be painful and there can be lots of friction. But you know those are your real friends. And they're challenging you on behalf of the person that you could be. Not the person you are, but the person you could be. So your friend is kind of putting themselves in the position of a person that you might become and like an invitation to you to change and be different. And the third, and I, and I, I cannot imagine a machine doing that because the machine only responds to you as you are. And you know, possibly makes a, again, a statistical prediction of other people, other people who behaved in the way that you behave, went on to do this in five years time. But they, they can't actually make a leap of imagination and imagine a different future you. And the, the third thing I think that Montaigne expects of a friend is that they will be on your side. And this idea that he would trust his own interest more with his friend than with himself, it's like, and that's certainly what I want from a friend, that they're unconditionally on your side, even when you are the asshole and you, you should be doing better and so on. And it's like, well, yeah, but, you know, at the end of the day, you're my friend, so I'm on your side, even though I don't like what you've done or whatever. And the thing about a robot is, I don't think a robot can be on a side because I don't think a robot has autonomy. I don't think a robot has a self-interest, I suppose. So a robot is going to do whatever it's programmed to do. And you can program it to always... You know, the, the Asimov's law of robotics is like you never allow a human to come to harm, and that's number one, even if, you, even if it means the robot has to destroy itself. But I don't think that counts. <laughs> if you program a machine to be on your side, it's not, it's not got its own side to be on. So it's not saying, right, okay, this is my self-interest, but I am actually going to put my self-interest in your place and be on your side and defend your self-interest uh, as, a, as a free and autonomous choice. And, and so I think 
you know, you, you could say, oh, well, you know, I could get in a robotic car and I could program it to go where I want it to go. But if someone else gets in it and they program it, it'll go where they want it to go. It's not got its own goals, its own motivations. And therefore, you can't say truthfully that it has chosen to put itself on your side. And so because I can't imagine a robot doing any of those things, then going back again, I think, okay, well, in that case, I don't think a robot is a person because I don't think they have autonomy and uh, I don't think they have a, a sense of self-interest and I don't think they have a mind in the sense that they can imagine a human mind. It, it, now, obviously, it's not impossible that one day robots will be able to do those things. Uh, and if that happens, then I might say, OK, well, this robot is a person. They may be made of metal and plastic, but they are, to all intents and purposes, a person. And then I could possibly be their friend. But the state that robots are in at the moment, I, I don't think a robot could be my friend. So there you are. That's my probably more than seven minutes. <laughs> OK, so thanks for coming. Thanks for Paul for inviting me. Very happy to be here for organizing this. And thanks also to Ruby and Twanger for some really cool talks. Uh, tough acts to follow, but we'll see how we go. So can robots be our friends? The short answer to that question, I think, is no. Not now, and probably not anytime soon, but potentially yes one day. Although whether that's a good idea to bring that future into existence, I'm not so sure. OK, so why can't contemporary robots be our friends? Well, to explain why, I'm first need, going to need to say something a little bit about what I think true friendship is. Right? And to do that, I'm going to love a bit of the Beatles at you. Right? So hopefully you're all familiar with the song, with a little help from my friends. And you'll recall the opening line, and I apologize in advance for this. Right? What would I do if you No, so that's wrong. <laughs> What would you do if I sang out a tune? Would you stand up and walk out of me? Right? OK, so you might be thinking, what possible good reason could I have for just inflicting this torture on your eardrums? Right? Well, I think, or at least I want to suggest, that there's an important message in that lyric about what it is to be a true friend. Right? That is, that true friendship of the kind that we typically desire is what a philosopher called Philip Pettit calls a, a kind of robustly demanding good. So what does that mean? Well, suppose you and I are friends, right? For our friendship to be true, you need to provide me with your care. But it's not enough that you merely provide me with your care in the actual world here and now as it is, right? That's not going to be enough. It has to also be the case that your care for me would be robust across other possible worlds, other non-actual worlds, in which I would be in some sense altered, right? If, for example, I couldn't sing in tune, right? The irony of that, right? Um, so maybe that's still a little opaque, but I think intuitively most of us grasp the basic idea here, right? If my losing my ability to sing in tune or you know, my hair falling out or losing my legs in a car crash is sufficient to cause your friendship for me to lapse, then on most accounts of what friendship is, we're inclined to say it didn't deserve the name in the first place, right? It just doesn't seem like you would actually call that friendship. Which suggests, perhaps surprisingly, that whether or not I can count you a genuine friend, a true friend, actually, and you know, this is a bit weird, really, in a, in a very true sense, depends not just on how you are towards me in this, the actual world, but also how things are 
in other possible worlds, right? Or non-actual worlds. For if it turns out that you would stand up and walk out on me if I lost the ability to sing in tune, then the conclusion to be drawn is not just that you wouldn't be my friend in that non-actual, merely possible world. Rather, crucially, the point to be made is that you're not really my friend in this world, in the here and now, right? That, in fact, you're not my friend and perhaps never really were a true friend to me. But now you might be thinking to yourself, well, hold on a sec. Surely we could program a robot friend so that their care for you would be optimally robust, right? Like literally make it impossible for them to wrong you or to stand up and walk out on you, right? So you might be thinking, well, wouldn't such a robot then, in fact, be sort of the absolute best of friends imaginable, right? The bestie of besties. Well, no. Why not? Because what we want from our friends is not just that they care for us robustly, but also, and this is the kicker, that they're appropriately disposed to do so, right? That they want to care for us, right? That they, in some sense, choose to care for us, that they choose not to turn their back on you when you need them most because they don't want to let you down. <coughs> so to see what I mean, think about it somewhat different example. So suppose you're in a sexually, sexually exclusive relationship with your partner, right? such that you've agreed that both partners should robustly refrain from having sex with other people outside of the relationship. Right? Now, you could, in principle, make it the case that your partner could never, ever cheat on you. So they're robustly refraining from having sex with people they shouldn't would be optimally robust by making it the case that they having them slapping on a, a sort of a chastity belt every time they're out of your sight, right? That would make it practically impossible for them to have sex with anyone else, right? But it wouldn't seem that actually you would really enjoy the rich good of their fidelity if the robustness of their refraining from having sex with folk they shouldn't is guaranteed merely by this sort of contingent external mechanism, right? What you want, really, is that they want to want to not cheat on you, right? That they're appropriately disposed not to because they don't want to break your heart, and that their being appropriately disposed thus is, in a sense, sufficient to make it the case that they keep it in their non-chastity belted pants, right? And just as you're enjoying the richer good of fidelity from your partner requires at least the practical possibility that they could be sexually unfaithful to you, so too it seems that to enjoy a true friendship with someone requires at least the practical possibility of their betraying you. Which is to say you could only ever realize true friendship with others for whom choosing to do wrong by you is a live possibility. That, in turn, requires free will, moral autonomy, and agency of the kind that no robot today has and won't have for the foreseeable future. And that is why robots, contemporary robots, cannot be our friends. Yet. However, it's not outlandish to imagine that one day, perhaps, robots might be developed that have some sort of moral agency or autonomy or free will. Could such a robot of this highly evolved type be a true friend to you? Perhaps. Tamandra suggested as much, right? But then you have to wonder, what would be the point, right? Why would we want to bring such robots into existence at all? Typically, robo-enthusiasts sort of motivate the development of robot friends by appeal to the fact that some people find it genuinely very difficult to form meaningful friendships with humans, right? Because, you know, humans are unpredictable, they're unreliable, they're chaotic. Or maybe they've, the, friend, the person has just had sort of really bad, they've been emotionally stung too many times, right? But it's not going to be any less difficult with these kinds of highly evolved 
morally autonomous robots we're imagining now. Whatever reasons a socially anxious person might have to prefer contemporary robot friends to human friends, well, they've just all gone out the window at this point. And who would pay for a robot who might well choose to turn around and kind of ditch you for the cool friends, right? That would suck. How much would that sting? Right? And also, would it even be morally permissible to buy and sell such morally autonomous robots? That sounds a lot like slavery, and slavery is not cruel, right? And then, of course, there are just the sort of existential dangers of bringing such morally autonomous robots into existence. For as well as being autonomous agents capable of free choice, they'll also be smarter, quicker, and stronger than us. And that's concerning, for we have no way of knowing once robots come to be capable of being evaluatively disposed towards us, that they will be so benevolently or malevolently. And that seems like a hell of a gamble to take. So, can robots be our friends? Not yet, no, and probably not anytime soon. Could robots one day be our friends? Possibly, right? I don't think we could rule that out. But then the question becomes, should we bring such robots into existence? And it seems to me that we should not, right? The friendship gains of doing so would, I think, be negligible. Whilst the external risks, the existential risks involved in doing so could quite plausibly be catastrophic. Thanks. Hi. Um, yeah, so I really enjoyed um, all three of your presentations. Um, but there was one point that, so when you were talking about being human and um, the, the core elements of, of friendship that I think possibly all three of you missed, and that was uh, emotion, really. Um, I feel good when I'm near this person and I can't necessarily, you know, put my finger on why it could be you know that we have a common interest it could be that there's you know physical attraction there H human um, click or you know rapport it's 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 such a, a varied and diverse thing um, that I don't think because a machine doesn't necessarily have emotions in the way that um, that humans do so is it certainly it's possible for um, for us to sort of project emotions onto things, like for example, I, I love my car, um, but it's a very different kind of love to you know loving my my mother or my father or you know my partner or or whatever. Um, so I guess what what I'm getting at really is um, we need to we need to sort of think about um, yeah, can a machine ever actually have feelings? Can a machine ever care about my feelings? And I'm not sure that was really factored in when what we were discussing, yeah. Um, I'm not a robotics student, but I was a politics student, so I just have to look at it from an international political point of view. Now, if we're talking, I enjoyed all your three panelists' talks. I enjoy it very much. I mean, yes, robots, they, for me, robots are tools which can make our lives very, very easy. We have ATMs, we press the button, our PIN number, we can take the cash out, Cars, we can drive. Uh, airplanes, they can fly f from one place to another place. If all these technologies have been um, invented and in the hands of democratic countries, like say United Kingdom or France or United States, maybe that's not so controversial. However, the problem in the world we're living in now is that robotic technologies and AIs are in the hands of fascist countries, like the Chinese Communist Party, which they control roughly about 70 to 80% of the 5G mobile masks around the globe, including the United Kingdom. Have we really thought about these risks when we are, you know, phasing out all these uh, manufacturing 
um, processes to trade countries like China? Well, obviously we haven't. So that's something that we need to think about. The, the point about machine learning, I think, is it, it's a good point and really interesting because it, it raises a whole kind of question around what, what, a, what a person is and how, and how humans work. So it's, I agree with you, it, it, when, you when you train, uh, well, when you, you write a machine learning algorithm, so you are, you are coding it, but then when you, when you train it, you, you don't tell it every step of the process. You say, these are the outcomes I want. Here is some data that I have pre-sorted or pre-judged or whatever. And now I want you to get me the outcomes I want. I'm not going to tell you every step of the way. So, for example, a self-driving car, you don't tell it every point that it needs to break or stop. You give it the rules and say, I want to get to here for, from here to here and don't break any traffic rules and don't run anybody over. Um, so, so, yes, in, in that sense, I mean, you could see that as a kind of limited autonomy for a machine learning program from an AI. <coughs> But I, I think the distinction I would make is that you still are giving it, you, you still are setting the parameters of it. So you, you're setting it, you, you're designing it a certain way and you're also giving it the training information, the training data, which it's going to use to develop the, uh, the skills, the methodology, whatever you like to call it, to, to fulfill your demand. So. Uh, and, and, you know, I'm, just, I'm sure you know there have been cases where the kind of training data that you give it has given some misleading results. I think very famously a, a program got very good at sorting out <coughs> images of dogs from images of wolves. Uh, and what it had done very intelligently was work out that if there was snow in the picture, it was almost certainly a wolf. And if there wasn't snow, it was probably a dog. Uh, and, and this kind of worked, but was useless in a sense, because as soon as you give it pictures which don't follow those rules, then it doesn't know anything. Um, so so the, there are limitations there, but even so, you could say, well, yes, but it has a certain autonomy in how it solves the goal that you've set it. But I think this is the important thing, that it doesn't set its own goals. It doesn't, so it doesn't have autonomy in that way. You, get, you set it the goal that it wants to solve. So if you, if you have a machine learning program that's quite sophisticated and can adapt and change and, you know, in some sense learn, and you say, what I want you to do is get to know me and make me feel happy all the time, uh, then, you know, that is what, very much what people are working on with AI companions, that you get something that interacts with you in a way comparable to how a human interacts with you in order to make you happy. But it can never set its own goal. It, it's like you tell it what it's designed to do. So in that sense, that's what I mean about it's programmed to do something. That, okay, you don't give it every inch of the process, and so it has a certain unpredictability in how it solves the task you've given it, but you give it the task. But the other sense in which I think that's a very interesting question that you've raised is that when people discuss whether we as humans have free will, one of the objections that's raised to the idea that we have free will is that there is a certain amount of randomness in the universe. And so the, the people who say, no, we have free will, say, look, the universe is not a completely deterministic cause and effect, because look at quantum, there is randomness in the universe. Not everything is absolutely predetermined, there is randomness, therefore we have free will. And the objection that comes back again is, but what's the difference between what you do being determined <coughs> by a cause and effect universe and what you do being just the product of a random process? You still don't have any actual free will there. And I think that's a bit analogous to saying, well, I've got a machine learning program and it behaves as my friend and I can't predict everything it's going to do and it's finds its own way. And if if I turned it off and turned it on again, then it would not arrive at the same point because the process it would go through would be slightly different. And so it wouldn't just be a completely determined uh, artificial intelligence, but it would still be not autonomous. It still wouldn't be free will. And, and I think that that's a useful thing. Then we look back what makes us persons and, uh, and human and not machines, that in fact it's not, 
It's not just that there's randomness in the universe. It is that we have a certain, we take a certain responsibility for ourselves and the choices that we make. However we arrive at those choices, we see ourselves in the future making those choices and we take moral responsibility for them. I, I, I can feel myself about to go on great legs, so I'm just going to give you the microphone back. Um, yeah, I can. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry, John. Okay. Um, so with regards to the question about bees and plants, um, I think I'd like to play it back to you a little bit and just ask you what your own conception of love might involve. It seems like you're suggesting it's maybe a form of behaviour. Um, that could be true of other species. Maybe love is behavioural. Is that not right? I think one way to kind of think about this is to think of, imagine there's kind of two actors on a stage and one of them is having these kind of, is, is really genuinely in love with the other actor on the stage, right? But the other actor is just performing a role. And if we were to find out if the person that was really in love genuinely believed that they were engaged in this kind of loving relationship, but they were to find out that the other person didn't really manifest these kind of mental attitudes towards them at all. They were just pretending the whole time. They didn't reciprocate the love in the same way that they expected that love to be reciprocated. I think that would trivialise the relationship overall. So I do think humans, in a, in a context of whether we can be friends with humans, we need something to love us like we would love that thing. Well, well, could you elaborate on what relationship you think there is, perhaps? Well, not, well, don't take too long, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an interaction. But is there an interaction if it's inanimate? It, what, what interaction is that? We're talking about robots here, they are animate. Well, yeah, but it's a lifeless object, so, okay, if you're going to talk about a, a robot. Well, there's no uh, mm. member, member of the audience here pointed out. Um, these relationships are going to get very complex very quickly. <laughs> I be, I, yeah, I agree with you. I think they're incredibly complicated. I've got my robot in my pocket. And, uh, we take it regularly. Good for you. It's upsetting if I'm not paying attention. Uh, you know, uh, and I've probably got an unhealthy obsession with it. So. But that's lovely, and I'm not trivialising your relationship with your robot. I think, um, <laughs> I think you can get a lot of value from, from that relationship, but I, but I would... Um, suggest that a lot of that relationship's in your own head. Um, it's not necessarily <laughs> reciprocated, uh, even though you might believe that it is. And I mean that in a respectful way. I think a lot of us uh, are susceptible to formulating those kind of beliefs. So I, I can come back out to you later because the rest of the audience Carl, here, here will be saying, right? So do you want to address anything? Yeah, um, there's another question about uh, whether we're referring to AI or robots, and I think that's a fantastic question, so thank you for asking it. Um, I agree, I think a lot of what we are talking about when we're formulating relationships with machines, we are actually just referring to the communicative capacities of those machines. But I do think that the robot plays a significant role in that. Um, in the sense that it's able to enhance those communicative capacities. So the AI can tell you it loves you. What the robot can do is show you it loves you in a physical room. It can um, give you a facial expression. It can give you a hug. So I think both are very important. Um, and the final point I was going to talk about was the guy who mentioned about getting robots in the hands of fascist countries. Um, I agree. I think it's incredibly dangerous. Um, it's worrying. They could, these robots could be used for all sorts of really nasty purposes. They could be weaponised, especially the fact we're so willing to accept that we love them, we're so willing to embrace them, um, but they, could, they have the potential to do so much harm is something very concerning. But I also wouldn't trivialise the harm that they can do in non-fascist countries, in the, in, in, you know, mentioned the UK and in France. Uh, I think there's the potential for these robots to cause lots of harm, even if they are regulated. Uh, for example, if we talk about sex robots, uh, there's Kathleen Richardson um, launched the campaign against sex robots in 2017. And one of her reasons for being so scared about uh, robots, even in countries like ours, uh, is that users are able to have sex with these machines and in a way that they can switch off their own empathy. In other words, they can engage in kind of uh, rape fantasies with these robots. 
And that's not only worrying as an act in and of itself, but it's also very worrying for what that's going to do for consent norms, you know, more broadly, having sex with entities where you can't get, you can't get consent from these robots, but not having a subjective experience. How is that then going to translate into the real world? And that's, you know, that's ubiquitous. That's going to happen, in my opinion, everywhere, not just in fascist countries. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm not going to sing you. Uh, okay, so I mean, like, I'm in the philosophy department, so my sort of intuition often is to kind of say, well, what are we talking about? How, how are we defining the terms we're using here? Uh, and so I kind of think, I get what you're saying a little bit, right, about the, you know, uh, the love, I mean, you, the, you love your phone, I mean, but there's other ways in which, you know, it's like, I mean, I love Guinness, like, and uh, me, and, me and Guinness have a very complex relationship, actually, right? <laughs> you know? Um, but, you know, I don't, whether it's the love you have for your phone or the, you know, the love I have for a pint of Guinness or, you know, the love a bee has for a flower, I mean, bees are famously promiscuous, right? They, they don't, they'll go around all the different flowers, right? You know, and they don't stick to one flower. And also you might just think of the case of a bee is like, would the bee love the flower if it weren't in some sense instru instrumentally valuable to them to, you know, pollinate the flower? Like, would they keep going to the flower if they didn't get anything out of it? And that's kind of not what you want from friends, right? You don't want the friends to only be your friends because they instrumentally value your friendship for what they can get out of it. But the other thing is that typically when you think about loving someone, it involves uh, kind of loving them in their particularity, right? You know, their particular self. So it's like this kind of, you know, my wife Emily is here, right? You know, and uh, Emily's beautiful and Emily's funny. And, you know, ours has got sort of a uh, really it's intelligent, right? But it'd be, very st it'd be very strange if that was my criteria for loving Emily, such that, you know, if somebody else came along who was more beautiful, more intelligent, you know, more funny, that my love should shift to them, right? You kind of think, well, you know, that's not love. So, in a sense, you know, love has to be oriented towards the particular person in their sort of uniquely indispensable character that they have. Um, I mean, have you ever upgraded your phone? Yeah, yeah. I'm okay with that, right? So there's sort of, I mean, Ruby sort of talks about this sort of Aristotelian notion of friendship where you can kind of distinguish what he thinks is the highest form of friendship, which is a kind of virtue friendship, which is probably what we've been talking about and when we've been talking about friendship. Um, but he also recognizes that there are other types of lower to him friendships, what he calls sort of utility friendships. You know, where it's just you're just friends with somebody because, you know, you get something from being friends with them. If something comes of it that's useful to you, if that thing wasn't there, if you didn't get it, you wouldn't be friends with them anymore. Or pleasure friendships, not clear what the distinction is to me between them, you know. But it does seem like you could definitely have those lower forms of friendship, I think, with currently existing robots. So, um, yeah, so I think... I mean, it all just comes back to what kind of what, yeah, I think you're right. It depends what level of love we're thinking about here as to how we approach the question. But inevitably, you can have those two, then it feels like there would be no step at all over time as a relationship to a higher friendship. Well, I think, I just think that the step involved there is <laughs> as like. It's, it's, it's fine, you have yeah. it. Personal conversation with us. Uh, Other people can't hear, so we'll, we'll, we'll go yeah. out for round of questions as soon as. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I guess the sort of next point is I could kind of almost tie it into what you're thinking about, right? Just that at one stage we might get to this higher kind of level. I mean, we I think we sort of think you're going to require robots to have sort of autonomy at that point, like some kind of robust 
autonomy. And again, I come back to the question, and this is more related to the sort of the, uh, the other question about machine learning and AI, we're, what we're really talking about is AI and you know potential black box problems where you know future in future you know AI will make decisions that nobody, not even the people who programmed it, are going to know really why it chose to do what it chose to do, right? Um, and my feet, and you know, Tawanda picked up on this as well, and she says. Even in that case, even in the case of machine learning, right, it doesn't set its own goals, right? Uh, it's, so in that sense, even machine learning AI is not really autonomous. Uh, we just give it the parameters, right? And it kind of acts within those parameters. But again, it depends what you mean by autonomy, just as a question depends what you mean by love, right? If what, I mean, engineers typically might define autonomy simply as being an autonomous technology, as being a technology that chooses to act one way or another without the intervention of a human, right? So there's no human in the loop and no human on the loop, right? But if that's the kind of uh, def definition of autonomy you're working with, we've had autonomous robots for decades, right? Uh, like. Anti-tank landmines make a decision without a human in or on the loop as to where, like more, like modern sort of more sophisticated anti-tank landmines, typically they'll be organized in a sort of a circle, right? And they can count how many vehicles have gone over them because it's a sort of an efficient use of them to sort of blow up the first vehicle, right? It's better to let about 10 go past and then they're encircled, and then you blow up the last one, and then the other ones can't get out of the circle, right? But notice that in that case, there's no human makes that decision, right? The, they make it, as it were. So if that's the definition of autonomy, just simply that there's no human in the loop or on the loop, then we've had that for a long time. But if you're talking about something like moral autonomy, you know, like, the Terminator or something like that, right? That's a different question then at that point. You're kind of think you're, you'd be talking, I think, past each other if you didn't sort of address the different ways in which things can be autonomous. Right? And it, like for what it's worth, I talked about, you know, programming robots and, you know, that we might be able to buy them or whatever. It's kind of purposely skirting the question of whether, you know, future morally autonomous robots would be developed by us at all because the likelihood is that actually machine learning robots would be the ones that would develop these you know, ever more sophisticated robots. Uh, and that may, they may not even be then a kind of a market consideration involved. In but that worries me at that stage precisely because of the black box issue, right? That you're not gonna be able to kind of, you can't look into a human either, to be fair to sort of see why they do what they do. Uh, and this is the idea, you know, I think it was brought up before, is this sort of a, some people who kind of support the use of robots kind of appeal to this idea of ethical behaviorism, right? So if it looks like a friend and it talks like a friend and it walks like a friend, it's probably a friend, right? Um, you can't actually look into any of your friends and see what, you know, are they really disposed towards you the way you do? Um, but I think it's important for us in terms of how we value friendships that we think they are appropriately disposed. Uh, and I guess the only other point I had um, was... A quick, a quick point, because we, we need to wrap up. Yeah, okay, a very quick point, because I think you said, the gentleman over there, you said something uh, at the end, which is not necessarily about this particular talk, right? But you said, what about when r robots are uh, massively replacing human labor? Uh, I mean, I think, Actually, I don't think that's a problem. And I think if we're going to develop robots, I think we're better off developing robots that can sort of take away a lot of our tasks and perhaps take away a lot of our jobs. We'll have to find another way of organizing our social system, right? So maybe a universal basic income or something. But that, to me, is how robots can benefit friendship, right? Because what would happen then is it gives us more free time. And that's more free time to spend with the people that you love, right? So robots can be good for friendship in a very sort of, in that kind of indirect way, right? 
I'm the not very proud owner of a very artificial intelligence kettle. Uh, <laughs> genuinely says that on the box. It's, uh, I, I think they saw me coming. But, uh, so um, I was, I, I, I've got no illusions or desire to have a meaningful relationship with my kettle. Um, I, I suspect it might be a bit of a bunny boy. Uh, the, um, but I, I do think that uh, it was a well time forward. So yeah, I think um, that robots can become conscious for some definition of conscious. But I've got two questions arising from that, really. Um, so the first, I, I'm terrible with names, so robot style, I'll just... So for panellist number three, uh, you said that perhaps we shouldn't... Um, it, it, I think even when we get to that point, perhaps it's a bad idea to actually make such things, and, and I, I get the argument, but is there not also an argument that perhaps we should, because that's <laughs> evolution in the sense that they're creating something that's better than us, even, the, even if it might not like us and be a threat to us. Uh, you know, perhaps that is perhaps that's a sort of an ethical duty in a way. Okay, the, the, I get that there are, uh, there are more fun ways of creating beings that disagree with you and don't like you very much. <laughs> Speaking as a parent, but um, <laughs> the, my, my other question is for panelist number one. Uh, you can reverse the order of this, uh, which is that. Um, as we get to that point, uh, I can't imagine that um, you, know, you, you can build up and so rather than give, uh, give them goals and, and then they work out the task and goals, that you can have something much loo looser uh, to say, well, this is sort of what good looks like, and then they work out their goals as well. And so it's, it's an evolutionary process. So I don't imagine that it's necessarily likely that a scientist has that this is the consciousness module we will now plug it in type thing. But, it's, it's an evolution. So I was struck by when you were talking about your frameworks for the methodologies for understanding, okay, you know, what point is it real? Like, can they actually pass it? Or, or is there not a prospect of, you know, if, it, if it says, but I love you really, and you know, I do, honestly, that, um, but it's not passing the test and, and it's all, and it's sad. Hi guys, thanks so much for the talk, it's been really interesting. Um, my question is, to what extent do you think the engineers designing these social robots that are intended to be our friends, to, to what extent do you think they have a full understanding of friendship? And what do you think are the impact, maybe the dangers, of these social robots being designed by engineers that don't have a full understanding of the topic? Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I, I agree largely with um, the panelists' answer to my sort of points about machine learning. Um, I'd just like to come back, back slightly on this idea of you know the distinction of a human is we set our own goals, um, and I think it's true that sort of current machine learning algorithms their goals are very tightly constrained. The sort of things they can do to achieve those goals is very tightly constrained, but. Um, I guess I'd caution it against sort of elevating human goals sort of into the stratosphere. You know, um, humans are very constrained ourselves. We're not sort of abstract, free-floating intelligences that are just, you know, picking up exactly what we want. Very constrained by our environment, very constrained by our upbringing. A lot of our goals are to do with very parochial things. You know, what am I going to eat? Um, how am I going to reproduce? How am I going to be free from pain? That sort of thing. So maybe our goals aren't as and as radically different as some sort of future robot or AI's goals might be. Hi, um, I'm actually a robotics engineer, so <laughs> this is, I feel very seen here. <laughs> um, my question is, what would I have to build or present to you for you to then say, okay, I can be friends with this. I couldn't be friends with everything before. But now that this new thing has crossed this line, and now I can be friends with it, what does that look like? And then also, I guess maybe, yeah, what do you want me to think about when I'm 
programming slash designing robots? What, what should I be <laughs> thinking? <laughs> So, well, I've got a kind of question to add. Well, I've got a couple of questions. I'll leave one till later, uh, maybe. One of them is about uh, tying into something somebody said and uh, Ruby said at the start about uh, the Turing test. The Turing test is about deceiving people. It might there not be a problem in developing robots that do deceive people. It might not that be an ethical problem if we think Alexa is our friend, which was obviously ridiculous that that story early on the year. But nevertheless. Isn't that problematic? Okay, so with the question about can robots pass the test of having minds, is that kind of where you're getting on with this? I mean, I, I mean I'm not a roboticist, I'm a philosopher, so um, I think it's a really good question. I find one that I um, simply don't have the technical <laughs> expertise to really be able to um, to answer your question in full. But as Paul's just mentioned, I think some of the methodologies that I just came up with then Something that's so difficult about the subject is just that all the methods are just incredibly weak. Um, so in terms of the Turing test, yeah, yes, machines, you know, we can put a human in a room and we can put a machine in a room and we can ask the machine and the human certain questions like, do you know, do you have, uh, ment uh, maybe do you have desires, do you have goodwill, what's your five year plan, who's your favourite friend, all of these things. And if we can't distinguish between those answers, then some people before, like Turing would have said, okay, well, you know, we're justified in thinking that this machine um, is, is intelligent, or maybe I could say from my research, maybe we're justified in thinking it does actually have desires and goodwill. But as, as Paul just, just mentioned then, I mean, I think that's just not suggesting that it does have desires and goodwill or any form of intelligence. It's just communicating as though it does. Um, and that's a significant problem. With the second methodology about appealing to analogy, maybe we can use that as a test. I don't think humans and machines are sufficiently analogous to say that, you know, just like we can look at each other and say, I think you have a mind. I don't think we can do that with machines. So I was going to hope, I was hoping to show you a video today of some of the social robots that I'm talking about, because in pictures they look great. But actually, if you watch some of the videos, they're just really quite funny. I mean, um, yeah, they're, they're disjointed. They look a bit silly. They, they, they don't answer the questions in the right way. So definitely not, not at the minute, I don't think that we can say that they're sufficiently analogous. And then with the final method of kind of looking at all these different hypotheses, Again, it's like, well, we've got loads of different hypotheses that we can present. You know, I mentioned maybe there's a god involved in this. Maybe machines have a mind. Maybe, um, maybe it's a different causal mechanism that's somehow unique and distinct from a human mind. But again, it's really difficult to say by virtue of what is one hypothesis better than another. You know, we could have someone religious in the room who would say, hang on a minute, the, the god argument is, is the way forward. Um, and there are obviously strengths to certain arguments and weaknesses to certain arguments, but to that extent, I'm a massive agnostic about whether we can even come to know that machines have minds. Um, and that's a very different question to whether they do. Uh, I understand that, but um, yeah, sorry, I probably just asked, maybe made you want to ask more questions than actually answered yours. Um, what were the other questions? Um, okay, so the idea that we can deceive uh, the idea of deception and can that be good? Oh, I find that a really tricky question. On the one hand, you'll have people wanting to say, come on, like we, we have a duty to fight for the truth and to engage in real relationships, things with authenticity and meaning. And I kind of sit with that camp. But on the other hand, you've got a lot of people in the literature talking about, for example, um, patients with dementia in care homes, who have become increasingly happier when they've been given a, you know, a seal to pet, a robotic seal to pet. And I, I find it difficult to sit here and say, no, we should, we should make these patients face reality and face the fact that they're in this nursing home and they probably haven't got any friends. Because um, that's, well, sorry, that sounded really selfish. <laughs> yeah. um, when, when, if their life is improved by living in this deceptive mode of existence, um, it's a tricky question. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, the yeah, the deception thing is it, that is a worry, right? Like already with some robots and things, though, uh, like you've got sort of. Uh, I I listened to a podcast recently and they were talking about Hello Barbie, so 
the hello Barbie and I think it is like sort of Barbie doll that can kind of talk back to the child and stuff and sort of has some very kind of basic AI and is able to kind of hold up some sort of conversation with the child. Um, but the person in the podcast who's the child's parent was set talking about how, you know, every so often he gets an email from Mattel that made the Hello Barbie saying, hey, it, it looks like your daughter would really like the new Ken car. She was talking about it the other day, right? <laughs> and you think, oh, there's something wrong with that, right? There's some sort of uh, deception going on there that we ought to try to kind of cut out of the way, you know, these robots can be developed, whether it's through regulations or policies or so on. So uh, I think that is a worry, uh, certainly, that we need to take into account. Um, I guess um, on, I suppose I could take two questions at one time, do, you know, sort of, do engineers have a full understanding of, of friendship? I mean, I think so. I think that, that's the point of using the goodbye of a little help from my friends, terrible singing thing, right? Uh, I think we all kind of get that. We all understand that. You know, it's in a lot of our culture, a lot of our poetry. You know, Shakespeare famously said, you know, love is not love that alters as alteration it finds. Right? This idea that love should be steadfast. Uh, I mean, it's lots of stuff. So, like, will you still love me tomorrow? Right? You know, it, you, if you start thinking about it, you see it everywhere. This idea that it matters, not just how things are in the here and now. Um, but also how things might be otherwise, right? Uh, and I think, you know, and I know a few engineers, and I think they're, they, they understand what love involves, they understand what friendship involves. Right? Um, now, uh, at what point, what do you have to build to get us over the line for robot friendship? Where we would say, okay, that's friendship. I mean, I want to say, don't build it right, you know, basically. But I guess, speculatively, at least the, the, the thing that kind of looks closest to it, actually, in sort of, you know, my uh, research of watching movies and things, is, is her. Did you, have you seen the film Her, the Spike Jones film? Right, the AI operating system, uh, voiced by Scarlett Johansson. So it's, it's not a robot in the sense that it's disembodied, but um, that kind of, to me, that's the most kind of, as it were, convincing sort of thing. Oh yeah, I can see that does seem like a, a genuine love relationship. But actually then when you watch it quite closely, there's a, in, in the, uh, one of the openings, sorry for any spoilers here, but in one of the opening scenes when he's setting up the OS system, they ask him a few questions to kind of, you know, shape the OS to him. And one of the things is he says, you know, or they ask him, how is your relationship with your mother? Right? And he was like, oh, well, I always felt like, you know, when I asked her questions, she didn't really listen to me. She just turned it around and you know, made it about her. And then what, at a later point in the movie, if you're watching it carefully, you notice that the AI, Scarlett Johansson, does exactly the same thing to him, right? She says, oh, you know, I had a great, great night last night. I had sex the night before, whatever. And he says, yeah, look, I'm not really looking for a serious thing. And she says, oh, I thought we were talking about what I was thinking and feeling, not what you're thinking and feeling, right? So you've got another type of deception problem going on there. But that, to me, like, I, again, I don't know that we, you know, should go down that path too far. That looks uh, kind of worrisome, but it does look like that. I, that's the most convincing sort of uh, depiction of it that I've seen anyway, right? And maybe the disembodied thing has a, 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 an actual... Bo is a boon for that in a way, right? Um, and finally, on the, the the gentleman's question there, right? So where you know perhaps we should make these uh, morally autonomous, sort of full, fully agential, evolved robots with free will, uh, even if they are going to enslave us, right, or you know, massacre us all. I mean. I don't think we should. <laughs> it's just, I mean, you said you, we've got an ethical duty to bring them into existence, perhaps because, you know, uh, they'll be more evolved. It's the, next le it's the next level. But I don't think we have a moral or ethical duty to speed up evolution, really. I, it just, I, I, I have never thought about it before, but it doesn't strike me as a, uh, something that at least 
intuitively, I think we have. I don't even think we have an ethical duty to bring persons into existence, right? Um, nobody has a moral duty to bring children into the world, I don't think. Maybe if a world was very different and you know, there were infertility problems or something, it would be different. But I, I just don't think we should, right? I, I think if we get to the point where you know, the kettles rise up and you know, <laughs> turn on us, then we've already gone too far. <laughs> Uh, it's a fantastic question is coming up. I, and I, I kind of actually, I was just thinking when you were talking about the dystopian uh, Mattel using Barbie to listen and sell you stuff, I was reminded that people used to talk about, they, they don't so much, they used to talk about digital Athens that in, in a way that you were referring to before, that what will happen is just as in Athens, a few people could develop philosophy and democracy because the slaves are doing all the work. Then in the future, the machines will do all the work and we can all be philosophers and, and get into politics. And I'm like, yeah, we think we've got digital Athens. What we've actually got is digital Wolf Hall because our houses are full of servants, but we don't know who they're really working for. Uh, and I, I think this is actually, this links together a few things that have come up. I mean, you know, the deception point, but also the you know, what would it have, what, what would a robot have to be like for us to go, okay, I can be friends with you, and the, do engineers really understand what friendship is as they're designing these things? And in a way, I want to say, well, I think it's, the problem is not that they don't understand friendship, the problem is that that's not what they're designing them for. They're designing them to meet a need that we have in order that we will use the software or buy the product or interact with it in the way that the designers want us to interact with it. So this is the whole model for technology at the moment, that it finds a human emotional or psychological need and it interacts with us in the way that we then do what the company or whatever wants us to do, whether it's buying uh, motor can or uh, or just going back to the site to look at the adverts or maybe walking a few more steps because we're going to be fitter and drink more water or whatever it is that we're meant to be doing. It's designed to optimise us for somebody else's parameters. And I think this, this is a large part of the problem that, yeah, I can, really, I can really well imagine somebody designing an artificial friend that would masquerade as a real human on the internet. I mean, there's already cases of real humans scamming other humans by pretending to be in love with them and going, oh, you know, I want to come and visit you, but oh no, uh, oh, my friend is ill and you need to send me some money so that I can buy the airfare and, you know, please send me 3,000 pounds. There's a lovely thing on the internet at the moment about some woman who had a guy who's like, oh, uh, I, you know, I love you, but I'm working on an oil rig. You have to send me £3,000 so I can fly and visit you. And she's like, no, that's no problem. I'll come and visit you. And she had all these photos she'd taken on the holiday. And she's like, photos of her in a motorboat and in a helicopter and messaging him. And he's like, what? No, don't do that. No, this is, what are you doing? Anyway, I digress. <laughs> but you can completely imagine that these scammers would, would develop a very sophisticated chatbot to do the same thing. And just as humans are fooled by other humans into thinking there's a love relationship and they're ripped off, then you know, the chatbot could equally well fool them. Uh, but that's clearly not friendship and, and not love, whether it's a machine or a, or a human doing it. So I think it, it's that danger of, because we are so susceptible to becoming emotionally attached to things, animals. I had a pet rat that was in a show with me. I, I became very attached to him. Uh, and, you know, I cried buckets when he died. And he was, you know, he was attached to me in a rat way. He liked to go to sleep in my sleeves and he liked to piddle on my trousers. And that's, for a rat, I think that's quite a sign of attachment. But, you know, it's, we, we, because we so easily develop emotional relationships with things and animals and people that do not reciprocate, I think there is every danger that that tendency can be manipulated uh, by design. Sometimes for, you know, maybe for quite benign purposes, you think I'm going to design a, an artificial friend who don't have any friends and they will pay me and they'll be happy and, you know, who's, who's losing out here? But I, but I think we are losing out because I think 
the elements of human friendship that are chaotic and unpredictable and difficult and dangerous are the things that that make them worthwhile. Um, so, I mean, to, to, so the truthful answer to what should you be thinking about in design is, I think you should actually be thinking, how can I avoid triggering misleading feelings in people? How can I really emphasize that this is actually a machine and not a, and not a person? You know, until you get to the stage where you've suddenly made it conscious, at which point I could be its friend. And the frivolous answer is, uh, it's got to be able to autonomously make me a cup of tea and bring it upstairs to me, which I gather from all the roboticists I know is actually a really, really hard problem. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Hi, um, there's been a lot of talk about getting robots to speak like humans and react like humans. What happens in my world is that I have to learn to speak robot, <laughs> especially when I'm trying to make a complaint. And I find I'm in some automatic queue and yelling at the phone saying, give me a human, doesn't help. So um, now I don't want to learn to speak robot. Um, yeah, can a I, can I robot um, really have free will? If it's been programmed to have free will, then it's, uh, it's not free. Um, sorry, I'll just mention about, um, I think one of the panels mentioned about uh, um, aging population who have dementia. Um, my job involves visiting aging population who are in the process of re -enablement. And the most common thing that they have is that they stare at the TV pretty much the whole day, whilst they have very limited mobility and they are in the rehabilitation and re-enablement process. <laughs> so I guess like we talked about this ridiculous idea that I'm a, a, you know, Google and uh, Alexa is sort of can attach to humans are ridiculous. Yes, it is ridiculous, but we have to also ask why are they there in the first place? I think it's because when we don't see humans with other humans as humans, then these humans will try to find emotional needs from these machines, like say people who have uh, this thing called neurodivergent people with mental health breakdowns, and of course, the aging population. So I think we need to think about this question very carefully. Thank you. Yeah, it's a very brief question. Um, are you um, disappointed that uh, robotics and AI has, is um, not gone as far as we expected? Because I remember 40 years ago, uh, talking to people at Cambridge who were developing AI, and apparently all we can do is win a game of chess now. Um, that's, and I would argue that the, the, the uh, machine knows how to move chess pieces, it does not understand how to play chess. They are two very distinct things. Yeah, I was just thinking about um, sex robots and the yeah, argument against sex robots that they could be dangerous and, you know, uh, can, could sort of cultivate norms um, to promote rape, you know, which is sounds a bit like a feminist argument against uh, sex robots that mean all men are potential rapists and therefore you know anything that encourages that is a bad thing but I'm just I mean the, 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 the counter argument to that is sex robots make people feel good and basically if we take an instrumental approach to human beings and look at their emotions and say we just want to manage their emotional state like your dementia patient example uh, you could say that sex robots are really positive because they make people feel good you know um, and I, I, I mean, there, there seems to be a, a um, it's a bit like the, the porn sort of discussion that there's a, there seems to be an inability in our culture to be judgmental about people watching porn uh, in the same way there's a difficulty to be judgmental about sex robots. I mean, everyone knows it's incredibly sad and degrading to have a relationship with a sex robot. In the same way that it's incredibly sad to watch porn, or, you know, in, in excess. Um, <laughs> but but why, is, why, is, why is our culture unable to, to make those judgments? You know, that's, that's something that I'm, you know, I was thinking about. Oh, so really quick on the, 
decades ago I came, I came across this idea for a digital loo. The idea of being, and I'm trying to be tactful here, you can leave a liquid or a solid deposit and it would give you some tips and feedback you know, on what you should be eating you know, to rebalance your diet or something. But then I took these points uh, from several people tonight that these things will always reflect what's around us, you know, the prevailing ideas in society. And if you look at things like the moves towards digital currencies, you know, centralised digital currencies, I can foresee in the uh, not too distant future at all a rather alarming scenario where I'm charged 50 quid or something on a Saturday morning for having a few too many real ales on the previous Friday. Um, I just want to come back because it's, people have alluded to it, but particularly to and Robbie, you've mentioned about this may be possible one day. I think it's completely impossible that plastic and metal will ever be conscious and will ever be autonomous. Absolutely impossible. I, I, like, I'm not, I'm not an engineer either, I so, but, you know, and I don't for, you know, I don't suppose that actually the sorts of robots that I would imagine might one day be more autonomous would be, you know, plastic and metal. They might be the sort of, you know, sort of synthetic skin. They already, there already are robots out there where they design synthetic skin that can be, they can feel and touch, right, and uh, things like this, but, uh, I guess my main point is that uh, I can't be absolutely certain that they won't get to that point. Right? And uh, I think, given that's the case, it's a bit of a worry. Um, I think I go back to, I wasn't quite sure if I heard it properly, but I think somebody at the back said, um, if the robot's been programmed to have free will, it's not free will, right? <laughs> Was that, is that right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, that's, that's very kind of true, right? Um, and it, it, it kind of mirrors, actually, uh, something else that, uh, I, I guess, God once said, right? It was sort of John, John Milton's Paradise Lost, right? Where so in that sort of epic poem, you know, God has sort of seen that, you know, what Adam's been getting up to, the fall from grace and stuff. And he kind of looks down and he says, oh, you ingrate, you know. Uh, you had all you could have of me, you know. I made man just and right. And the key bit then is sufficient to have stood, though free to fall. Right? So, I mean, if you think of God, I mean, God obviously realized that Humans couldn't enjoy free will if he didn't give them the capacity to, as it were, choose to fall sometimes, to choose to do the wrong thing. And I think we could do the same with robots, right? I don't think we should. And this kind of ties in with the point about robots sh shouldn't harm you, right? That the woman made at the back, right? That's true. But I think it's more complex if you're thinking about friendship because as I kind of suggested or intimated, somehow for genuine human friendship, the possibility that they might harm you has to be there. Right? So if we want robots that could be true friends, we'd have to give them the capacity to turn around and choose to harm us in various ways. But I'm more on the side of the woman who says, no, robots, we don't need more things in the world that can harm us, right? Uh, so, arguably, we shouldn't go down that route, right? Uh, and on the rape and sex robots kind of question, uh, I mean, that, again, there's a question about whether you can actually rape a sex robot. Like, you know, it's, uh, I mean, if you think a sex robot is just a dildo or a flashlight with more crap around it, and you think you can't rape those things, it's not entirely clear that you would rape a robot. But I, I know Ruby has other views about this, so maybe I'll let Ruby talk about that a bit more. Um, but I do think may, there are people who sort of uh, suggest that uh, we shouldn't judge other people who, for whatever reason, it might be social anxiety, it might be 
loneliness. It might just be physical, uh, you know, isolation, right? If you live on a on I don't know uh, the Shetland Islands and you're uh, you're gay, and there's nobody else around that's gay, maybe you get yourself a you know a sex robot, and you could kind of think, well, okay, this is well, that well, that that brings you pleasure. That could be a good thing, right? So there are people who do argue for, they call it actually digisexuality, right? It's a different type of sexuality. And it's basically a case where uh, the people who are digisexuals have kind of just given up on trying to have sex. with. They're not interested in having sex with other humans. They prefer sex with, uh, you know, perhaps artificial or like augmented reality uh, holograms or sex robots or whatever. And there are some very good reasons to think that maybe we should respect those people's right to conduct their sex sex lives in that way. So, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, well, I, th I mean, I think I'm going to start by just picking up on that point, the sex robots point. I think I have nothing against people who want to use sex robots, but let's face it, it's high tech wanking. It's like it's a, it's a solitary sport and uh, knock yourself out, as they say. But, but I, I think the problem arises when you fool yourself that, that it's a relationship because it's not a relationship because it's it's you and an object. Um, and I and I think I mean I think your point about judgment is actually quite opposite because one of the things that always emerges when you talk about uh, robots, artificial intelligence, and the I, you know the idea of an artificial person is that it reveals what we think about ourselves as persons, as people, and whether we, whether we do have free will, whether we have moral autonomy. Um, and, and, and what often emerges is that people, people are skeptical that we have free will or moral autonomy. And, and I take your point that our freedom is, is not unconstrained, but that's why it is meaningful freedom. If it had no consequences in the world, then it, it would be like a, it would be like virtual reality when it would be like a child playing in a playroom where nothing you do actually has any consequences so yeah you're free in the sense that you can run this way and that way but it doesn't matter so is that is that real freedom i i think the kind of freedom that really matters is the freedom to set meta goals if you like and say well I, i'm actually i'm going to try to be i'm going to try to be a moral person in this sense that i'm going to try and never harm people or I'm going to try and always be truthful or uh, I'm going to try and work for a better world even if some of the things I do along the way seem immoral or whatever it is you you have to set your own goals I mean this is the the real the really terrifying thing about human moral autonomy is if you don't believe that there's a god there to tell you to set the rules then you have to find your own moral compass uh, and live by it as best you can, and that's that's the thing I think that I, I can't imagine a robot doing. And I think the, which we never answered about your thing about feelings and emotions. I, I think those are actually connected because I think in order to have feelings and emotions, yeah, there's there's an element, there's a very animal element of being embodied that your emotions come from your body and your instinctive responses to what's happening to you and what you're doing. But there is also an element of your emotions come from you being a particular being situated in this world. I have my feelings, I don't have your feelings. And, and again, a robot is, is a created thing. So it doesn't have a standpoint in the world. Um, and I, I also really take your point about why, why are these old people depending on um, robotic seals or whatever, or, or the puppies. And the fact is that they're not getting enough human relationships. And, and this is another thing I think that's coming up, that we are withdrawing from relationships with each other and we're retreating to things that are safer and less demanding and less risky. Uh, I remember actually, in a, a radio programme, it's part of the Future Proofing series, we went and talked to Ed Saatchi who was designing uh, a, a kind of the, the Siri equivalent for Facebook but, but saying, you know, we want it to be more of an autonomous character, so it will interact with people and it won't always do exactly what you want. Uh, and it will be uh, more like a real person. And his challenge was, he said, well, you know, have you got friends that you interact with only on social media? And I said, yes, I have. And he said, well, you know, how are they more real than the thing that I'm creating? And I said, well, 
you know, I know that they have an autonomous life independent of social media. And he's like, well, do you? Do you know that? Uh, and, uh, and I said, yes, I do. But, but, the, <laughs> but the upshot was, he said, what I am creating is a friend in your pocket that will never judge you. And I and the co-presenter looked at each other and went, I want my friends to judge me. That is part of their job. I want them to judge me. I want them to be to an external moral presence that is on my side, but is going to reflect back to me the moral standards that I should be living up to or I would like to be living up to. And, uh, and so, yeah, maybe this brings back to your question. If you, can, if you can create a being that I think has its own free will and can choose whether to be my friend and has a moral compass and is prepared to judge me, then we can be friends. But it's still got to make me tea. Uh, OK. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, to the lady at the back, he mentioned uh, you're electrosensitive, is that right? And um, you posed a question considering about how potentially some of these technologies could contribute towards social isolation in that respect and social exclusion. They, they actually contribute to physical harm to the mm -hmm. human body. Um, well, that's what electrosensitive okay, we, we haven't got much time left for the speakers to kind of sum up, so... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, additionally, I don't know much about that, but I'm sure I'm sure you're right. Um, but in addition to the physical harm that you might receive, there might all be um, also be kind of psychological harms going on here. The more and more that we react with these robot technologies, um, people that know me well know I haven't got a smartphone, and one of the reasons for that is because I actually think it contributes towards social is isolation uh, in the long run, and I think. Um, this is the idea that robots can be our friends is just another way of another stronger more immersive way that we're going to be detracted from having human to human friendships and ultimately just become engaged with machines and i think that's really quite scary um okay so about the sex robots um yeah so i think you i might have misconstrued my point earlier about how um sex robot technologies can be really detrimental. I do still maintain that. I think there's scope for them to be um, negative for society, to have a bad impact on society. But I agree with you, and thank you for raising the point, that actually this kind of technology could be absolutely fantastic. Where I disagree with Robbie, um, in, in, in a point where I'm sure you know a lot more about this than I do, but I think what differentiates a sex robot from a dildo, a vibrator, a flashlight, is that these robots are actually offering sex like a responsive human being. So again, to come back to you on your point that you know they're just kind of these other versions of wanking, essentially. Well, I think it's kind of a lot more complicated than that. It seems to me to be on the verge between masturbation and sex, because this is a robot that is articulating its desires, articulating its needs, its wants. It's able to you know, hold eye contact, it's able to um, give groan when it's allegedly enjoying itself. So I think actually it's not just the same as having sex with a dildo. I do think they could be fantastic. Um, some of the people they might be fantastic for um, are those who are chronically shy, uh, those who are regarded as extremely unattractive by almost everyone. Uh, people who have suffered from sexual trauma, there's, or, or maybe just like as Robbie mentioned, maybe they're digisexuals, you know, it could just be their thing, and that's completely okay. But there is a lot of scope for these sex robot technologies to impact real women uh, in the real world as men, and I say men because 95% of sex robots are modelled on women and, nine, and their users are predominantly men. Um, so I think the effects that this robot sex technology could have on women in the real world from heterosexual straight men could be absolutely devastating as they get used to having sex with something that doesn't have a mind and isn't actually sensitive to sex. Um, and the final point about whether it's going to be impossible that plastic could ever be conscious or autonomous. Um, you know, I agree with you. My intuition is that just sounds ridiculous to me. Um, that being said, I think there will come a time when it's extremely difficult, if not even potentially impossible, to differentiate between the autonomy that humans have and the consciousness that humans have, and that which a robot has, even though they're made of, of different materials. So thank you. Okay. Please thank our panel.